Thank you very much for tuning in. Today we're going to talk about building happy homes. That's an interesting subject because there are very few happy homes in America. There's a wrong definition of happiness. Some people think happiness is defined by simply material uh, wealth. A nice home in the subdivision, a boat, an SUV, a European sports car, uh, nice vacations, fishing, hunting, golfing equipment, and uh, big, big money being wasted for education, for questionable colleges and this kind of institutions that raise their tuitions by double digits and people put up with it, they don't speak up for themselves, they just put up with the greed of colleges and then when they go to the church and they make a plea for an offering uh, then the preacher is being accused of being greedy and after the money whereas people willingly willingly throw their money in a prodigal lifestyle throw it out and spend money, waste their money for the most ungodly things without ever questioning the mode of behavior. In order to have happy homes, in order to build, build, to build happy homes, there need to be some healthy habits instilled in people. We have to follow the teachings of the Bible. And it's not just a superficial salvation that I'm talking about. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about repeating a little prayer and saying a couple of things and uh, e easy believism and this kind of stuff. That will not build happy homes. You have to follow the teachings, the doctrines of the Bible. And you know what I'm talking about. First of all, in order to build happy homes, you have to abstain from the filth that is being spread by uh, the media in the form of news broadcasts, in the form of movies, in the form of sitcom and soap opera and all this kind of garbage. You just have to quit watching that and you have to separate yourself from that and to set yourself apart. Because all of these media outlets, basically all they do is encourage you to commit sin. The Bible says in Romans 1.28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And folks, we see a reprobate mind at work at everywhere in, in American society. The mindset of people is that reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. People are always taking pleasure in doing things that do not please God. They always do the opposite of what God says. Even in churches, this is happening. I can tell you of Baptist churches where people pride themselves to do the opposite of God's word. God says, wear modest clothing, wear modest apparel, and have a meek and quiet spirit. Well, you go into these churches, they, have the most, they wear the most immodest stuff, and they have a loud, imperious, forward uh, spirit. It's the opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says, obey the leaders in your church, obey your pastor, obey your elders that rule well. And then you go into this church and what, what, do, you, what do you see? Uh, the people are bossing the pastor around, the pastor is just a, a hireling who has to answer to some kind of elder board and it's complete insubordination, it's just a clique of some wealthy influential guys, uh, they run the church. This is not the way God set it up, folks. So if, if you believe in these business meetings and the pure democracy in the church, folks, you've been misled big time. You've been misled big time. I really ask you to get a hold of the scriptures and do your homework. Uh, there's, there's other things that are not consistent. Where Christians today simply, they have not learned to obey the Bible. They have not learned to follow the teachings of the Bible. And for some reason... In their daily life, they do the opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says, for example, in Titus chapter 2, that the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become of holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, keepers at home, good obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Nowadays, the word of God is being blasphemed big time by church-going Christians. Yes, because the aged women are no longer teachers of good things. I see a lot of churches many times where the aged women are committing gossip, backbiting, 
false, accus false accusations, whispering, all kinds of evil habits, evil behavior. I've seen this. And instead of teaching the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, I've seen the aged women teaching the young women to rebel against their husbands, to make sure they have it their way, and to utterly uh, forsake the husband, and, and actually uh, create a setup where the husband is no longer the spiritual leader. This is wrong, folks. I have seen aged women who are trying to brainwash the younger women away from their husbands, especially when they go to a Bible-believing church. Now, this is wicked above all things that is happening. So in order to build happy homes, we have to return to not just what the churches today are saying, because what they say mostly is corrupt and is compromised. We have to develop some Bible-based convictions. Folks, we need to get convictions back and not compromises. Compromise might lead to temporary happiness, but down the road, they lead to a whole lot of regret and deadness and dryness. Whereas if you stick, if you stick to your convictions, it might lead to split and division and it might lead to even persecution. But in the long run, you will be glad that you stood up for what you believe. I want to talk today about building happy homes, and we're going to contrast this picture. Uh, I have this little poem here from Felicia Hemans. It says, Thy free, fair homes, my country, long, long in hut and hall, may hearts of native proof be reared to guard each hallowed wall, and green forever be the groves, and bright the flowery sod, where first the child's glad spirit loves its country, and it's God. Let's look at these contrasted pictures. There is no sweeter word than home. Around the fireside cluster all that makes life beautiful. Love, trust, charity, truth, and beauty. There husband and wife prove the loveliness of unselfish union. There the youth gain aspirations and the training for a noble life. There the maiden learns the sweetness of unsullied purity and gentle deeds. Much lies upon the man before he can be worthy of a happy home, much upon the woman. Some examples teach by warning, as others by furnishing models for imitation. Let us take a common case. A girl marries. She has been reared by an unwise, though fond mother, whose slavish devotion to her children has made her an unlovely household drudge. She has been brought up to be that wretched thing, a gaudy slattern. She is unkempt at breakfast and elsewhere at home, but gay beyond the household means for others, is ashamed of and discontented with her surroundings. City life to such an one is a cheerless, if not fatal, thing. After her marriage, the young couple live uh, with her parents, and what the wretched home education has taught grows into life habit. Or perhaps they board in some house where idleness and gossip grow like noxious weeds, choking the possibilities of good. There is no wholesome work of head or hand, a wretched life of complaint ensues. The girl becomes the mother of ch children she is all unfit to rear. A querulous, discontented wife doing nothing. Often unable to see anything to do to aid in building a home. In the end, when her husband has won a house of his own, this woman drifts into a likeness of her mother. She is shrill-voiced, careless of raiment, old before her time, with no sign of the fair, calm, matronly beauty, that second blossoming after seed time, which should come to replace the young charm, the Indian summer, almost as fair as wakening springtime. Her very love for her children works their hurt because there is no guidance. The man is 
as often to blame, seeming to live for business alone or vastly worse, only for boon companions. It is true that the wife, if she be one of those exceptional beings who can answer harsh words or the more bitter neglect with a smile, who will make home sweet even when her own life is as ashes within her lips, will, in the end, win any man to home and duty. Of such women there are a few martyrs as worthy of our highest homage as any that ever perished at the stake. But such a husband has no right to expect his wife to prove one of them. God's law is that whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. The enforcement of this law is nearly always as speedy and obvious as it is ultimately certain. The man sows indifference, neglect, unfaithfulness, and he reaps bitter recriminations, domestic brawls and jealousies, a full and hideous crop. Let's talk about the ideal country home. In country life, the way is more smooth for both, though far from easy. The life of a farm is hard, especially so for the woman, but there is work for willing hands to do. There is the home to be made a haven of rest and sweet content. The wife should never forget her high ideal of home life and that she must be the center of its beauty, though they have but a log hut amidst the wilderness, she may make that wilderness blossom as the rose. She may have small share of beauty, yet she may still be exceeding fair in her husband's eyes. Let them both remember it is not the harsh word that heals the breach. When the children come, let there be order. But remember, children are not machines. Train them as you would a vine uh, by daily, hourly care and thought, by example, not by hard rules. A child needs play, air, sunlight, and above all, love and sympathy. He needs a gentle mother breast wherein to pour the little griefs which, though quickly flown, are at the moment all as poignant as the weightier woes of later years. Teach by love, teach by example. Be chary of stern precepts for which the child can see no reason but your arbitrary will. If you would have your child respect you, to say nothing of his love, never punish him in a spirit of anger. Never make him a promise without performing it. Remember, there are nearly always other and better modes of punishment than beating him. Remove some present or deny some expected pleasure instead. Let him, if the thought be grave, feel your grave displeasure. Never scold. Govern firmly, but don't govern too much. Threaten seldom, never idly. The parent who tells a child, If you do so-and-so, I will do so-and-so with you, and then weakly forgets both the broken command and the assigned penalty for it, merits and receives the child's contempt in all things. Remember the tremendous force of parental example. Long before he learns his letters, your toddling one has read your daily life through and through. He molds his little life by the pattern you present him. For your child's sake, no less than your own, see to it then that your life is upright, true, and pure. Oh, the tender grace and sweetness of the home where love and duty reign supreme, love and duty, where the husband and father may cast off his load of daily care, where the wife and mother, grown lovelier by her self-restraint and thought for others, shines beside the hearth, the dearest and the sacredest of all created things. In many a home, even in these degenerate days, May such a wife and mother be found, a woman not too pure and good, for human nature's daily food, for wholesome pleasures, simple wiles, praise, blame, love, kisses, tears, and tears, and smile. Let's talk about the farmer's wife. From the day when a bride, she has entered that house wherein the home lies, as does the sculptor's dream of genius within the marble block, 
needing the patient, loving toil to bring forth its lines of beauty, through days or years of sorrow or of sunshine, with many a rebellious thought, fancy, or longing to be trodden down in the path of duty, amid griefs and heartaches not merely to be endured, but to be made stepping stones to, yet, to a yet higher and nobler life. Through childbirth pain and weary illness, still guided by the light of love and truth, the true woman moves on, blessing all who come within her influence. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Woe to the man who shall mar the happiness of the home life. And how many a farmer unthinkingly does this. He amuses himself. He goes to town to buy and sell. He hires labor when there is much to do, but he habitually neglects his fellow toiler and help meet in the house. At the, at the busy season, the work heaped upon the women folks almost crushes the life out of them. All this is to his own future infinite loss. The life of too many farmers' wives is what no man could bear and no woman should be made to suffer. It would be a standing shame to the men of America, a disgrace to our nation, if anywhere the women should become slaves without even the slaves' holidays as brutally sacrificed to the chase for the almighty dollar as ever victim dragged before the throne of Moloch. As a child needs play, so men and women need some form of innocent pleasure. If all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, so from Jill it either crusheth all her brightness and beauty, or else almost forces her to rebel against social and domestic law in search of a less intolerable lot. Work, the wife of a farmer must, but he should make the burden as light as possible. The overworked wife. Does any reader recognize this picture of the overworked wife drawn by Eller Wheeler, one of the most sympathetic poets of the West? If so, let him have a care, uh, lest he too become such a tyrant to such a slave. Up with the birds in the early morning, the dewdrop glows like a precious gem. Beautiful tints in the skies are dawning, but she's never a moment to look at them. The men are wanting their breakfast early. She must not linger. She must not wait. For words that are sharp and looks that are surly are what the men give when the meals are late. O oh, glorious colors that clouds are turning, if she would but look over hills and trees. But here are the dishes, and here is the churning. Those things must always yield to these. The world is filled with the wine of beauty, if she could but pause and drink it in. But pleasure, she says, must wait for duty. Neglected work is committed sin. The day grows hot and her hands grow weary. Oh, for an hour to cool her head. Out with the birds and winds so cheery. So she must rise in the morning and make her bread. The busy men in the hayfield working, if they saw her sitting with idle hands, would think her lazy and call it shirking, and she never could make them understand. They do not know the heart within her hungers for beauty and things sublime. They only know that they want their dinner, plenty of it, and just on time. And after the sweeping and churning and baking and dinner dishes are all put by, she sits and sews, uh, though her head is aching, till time for supper and chores draw, draws nigh. Her boys at school must look like others, she says, as she patches their frocks and hose. For the world is quick to send your mothers for the least neglect of their children's clothes. Her husband comes from the field of labor. He gives no praise to his weary wife. She's done no more than has her neighbor. Tis the lot of all in country life. But after the strife and weary tussle with life, with life is done, and she lies at rest, the nation's brain and heart and muscle, her sons and daughters, shall call, shall call her blessed. And I think the sweetest joy of heaven, the rarest bliss of eternal life, and the fairest crown of all will be given unto the wayworn farmer's wife. Let's talk about the sons and daughters on the farm. It's not necessary that the boy reared in the country should be a farmer. 
Farmers' sons often become leaders in trade, commerce, the arts, science, politics, or letters. In fact, it is from the country that the vigor of the city is constantly recruited. Hence the necessity of educating every boy to fit him, not for some single groove in life, but to occupy any plane his talents and industry may enable him to reach. But does he choose the farm? There is here as high an ideal, as great a field for action as anywhere in the wide world. Nor are the daughters of the household, because they are the children of farmers, all of necessity to become farmers' wives. It may be happy uh, for them if they do, uh, for there is no condition in life where more true enjoyment may be had than in the tillage of the soil, in the rearing of stock, a well-kept garden, an orchard dropping luscious and healthful fruits, a comfortable dwelling, and well-kept grounds. These every industrious family may have, however few the acres. We can no more control the affections of the daughters than the talents of the sons. But much may be accomplished by so directing education that these talents and affections may be carried in natural channels. The boy who is the mere drudge of the farm and the girl that of the kitchen will always be looking afar for that happiness denied them at home. It is the instinct of all young animals to play. By both his physical and mental constitution, the child requires exercise to promote growth, harden the bones, strengthen the muscles and sinews, and recreate the brain. This must be found outside the daily routine of labor, whether it be of the farm, the workshop, or the school. In directing these matters, nature must be counseled and uh, cooperated with. She cannot be rudely overridden and disregarded without exacting a heavy penalty in a stunted and misshapen life. Let's talk about youthful activity. The idler is the product of bad training. He is peculiarly in danger of becoming vicious. Hence, when a child is inclined to be idle, otherwise than as the result of grinding overwork, care should be taken to arouse the natural activity. Some natures develop slowly, yet bear noble fruit. These need a stimulus. Others, unduly precocious, should be checked. If a child becomes too early absorbed in study, the life may be brilliant indeed, but is likely to be short. The tree that too soon puts on fruitage is the tree that prematurely decays. There is no better place for the precocious youth than the farm. Let such watch the squirrels darting here and there in the groves Gather flowers in warm nukes in the spring. Play in the new mown hay in the summer meadows. Fish or swim in brook or pond. Go nutting in the autumns. And coast, skate, or snare rabbits in the winter. It will round out and freshen the growth. And when time again comes for study, renewed health will enable the brain to carry its load. Thus, the slow child should be led, and the too quick-witted one held back. But the lash in the one case, or too sharp a curb in the other, might be fatal. We must in every case try to wisely guide, to be able to understand the nature of a child, to diagnose the mind even as a good physician would an illness. The duties of parents do not end when the children are fed and clothed. The moral is higher than the physical. They must have a pleasant home, must be interested in all that is going on, and help in their small way to create beauty. Thus, they will learn to love labor for what it brings and to love beauty for what it gives. In afterlife, however successful one may be, the old homestead, even though it be but the simplest cottage, should be looked back to as the place where the happiest days of life were spent, the remembrance of father and mother be cherished as those to whom the mistakes and successes of life might always be carried as to careful counselors, the sisters and brothers ever ready to assist with word or deed. Let's talk about adorning the home. Wherever the home may be, whether in city or country, it is little things 
that make up the household comforts. In cities, little can be done except to keep the surroundings, small though they may be, neat and tidy. The small yard, if any, may have a little green grass and a few plants. The windows, in any event, should have a few pots of choice flowers. In the, ordin in the, in the ordinary city home, great display should not be thought of. A single plant, well grown, is better than a window crowded, full of ill-looking uh, and untidy starvelings. The village home presents greater capabilities. A few handsome trees for shade, a smooth green lawn with here and there a bed of flowers, running roses trained to the veranda, a clinging vine over the porch, and a path winding gracefully with gentle curves to the door will speak eloquently of taste and contentment in the owner. It will be a suggestion of happy, smiling children, a careful father, a fond and earnest mother. Inside you are sure to find, inside you are sure to find neatness, order, and reliance one on another. The walls will not be bare of pictures, nor the windows of flowers, nor will there be wanting those little elegancies of feminine work that tell of taste and refinement in every department of the household. There may not be wealth, but there will be something better, comfort. The husband may be at work all day in a shop, the wife perhaps working at home, but it will be cheerful labor. Let's talk about improving the homestead. The workman in city or village may not own his own home. The majority do not. The farmer usually owns the farm he works. He may be in debt, and of course his first endeavor must be to make himself and family free. Yet even while doing this, there is many a labor of love that will make the place increase yearly in value and beauty. An orchard may be planted, a vegetable garden cultivated, and trees set out to shade the lawn between the house and the road. Fences may be repaired and vines and trellis work made to beautify the home. Such labor is scarcely felt, and as the years roll by, the cattle and horses, sheep and other stock will be increasing and growing in numbers as the home increases in value and attractiveness. Let's talk about the sports of childhood. There is no aristocracy among children. If we see a child sneering at one not so well dressed as herself or bragging about his parents' riches, be sure something is wrong at home. It is after we grow up that we really look down on those not so favored as ourselves. But if the proper training has been given in youth, the man or woman will have only kindly feelings and a pleasant word for all where the person is not bad at heart and average human nature is not so. The well-bred child is as happy in sport with one cleanly dressed child as another. Childhood is a true republic where all contribute to the general wealth. It is the duty then of the parents to provide such amusements as may lie within their means. Skipping ropes, swings, dolls, and other feminine articles for the girls, the coveted knife or hatchet, the little wagon or wheelbarrow for the boys, and the jolly ride behind the farm team that is pleasure always. If there is water near, both boys and girls should be taught to manage a boat, and as a matter of precaution, both should learn to swim. Bathing dresses are cheap, and danger of accident will be lessened. Athletic sports should never be denied to boys, and girls should be allowed to race to their heart's content. Dresses may be sold and clothes be torn. Such things inhere among the necessities of childhood. Indeed, we would give but little for the girl who never sold her dress or the boy who never had a rent in coat or trousers. Far better these annoyances when supplemented with the glow of health, the strength of muscle, and the innocent cheerfulness that come with them than that children should always look as though they had just come out of a bandbox. As children grow, their sport may be directed in practical channels. Both boys and girls should be taught to gather plants. 
These may be studied, and thus the first lessons in botanic taught. Let them learn to distinguish noxious plants from innocent ones, plants of use from what we call weeds, for weeds are simply plants out of place, many of them being valuable for their medicinal virtues. Even the chores about the farm may come with a little instruction to be regarded as near of kin to play, the calves and colts and lambs are to be conciliated while being fed. The older animals taught that although boys are sometimes rough, they are nevertheless kindly. Even the village boy and girl may thus be trained to love rural life in the little attentions they bestow on the pet calf or lamb and the thriving pig rear, although these may be for the butcher. Let's talk about the lessons from the garden. The garden everywhere may be made a never-ceasing source of pleasure until even its labors will be eagerly sought. The preparation of the tiny seeds, the careful planting, the wonders of germination and growth, the blossoming and the ripe fruits, all will be enjoyed when we come to understand something of the mysteries of vegetable life. Why the South ripens the pineapple, the banana, and the pomegranate, the middle region, the grape, the pear, the peach, and the ever-welcome apple, from whence we get the tomato, the melon, okra, eggplant, the potato, and other exotics not known beyond their native homes until civilization and commerce brought the products of the four quarters of the globe even to our doors, how fruits Vegetables and brilliant flowers have become possible about every home, even in lands but a few years ago supposed to be almost uninhabitable. These and a thousand other entertaining questions may be asked and answered in connection with the boy's work in the garden. Thus, you train him in habits of thought as well as of industry. It is a great thing for your boy to rise to the conception that work is more than sweat and muscle more even than the greasy dollars received for the crop. Why does the farmer and mechanic of today live more comfortably and really better than the nobles of 200 years ago? Why have we a broader and wider intelligence today than in the old feudal times? Education has been different among the masses. Every man is his own master, and head work directs the labor of his hands. Why are we as a people more prosperous and happy than others? It is the feeling that all honest labor is alike honorable and that agriculture is the groundwork of permanent wealth. Let's talk about the treatment of children. Here are 17 rules. Number one, never swear or use coarse language in the presence of children. Number two, Never lower their self-respect by calling them harsh names. Number three, be free to praise a child judiciously when deserving. Number four, never break promises make, made to children. Teach truth by example. Number five, if necessary to chastise a child, do not do so brutally. Number six, do not expect of children the judgment and care of older persons. Number seven, it is cruel to keep children up late at night or to waken them early in the morning. They require and should have more sleep than grown persons. Number eight, make of your child a companion, counsel with it, and listen to its sorrows and joys as to those of a friend. Now, number nine, do not cruelly repel its love and drive it to other confidants. Number ten, do not embitter with brutality and harshness the only portion of life that can ever be happy. Number 11. A child should be dressed respectably. To cause it to wear coarse or ill-fitting clothes is sure to degrade it. Number 12. Teach a child the value of money. Let it have small sums to expend but require an account to be kept and then show to it whether its purchases are wise or not. Number 13. Reason with your children and show them the evils of vice, intemperance, and other bad habits. Number 14. Teach them to be careful, cleanly, considerate, 
true, and honest. Number 15. Do not overtask them mentally or physically. Number 16. Give plenty of time for recreation and encourage healthful out-of-door games and exercises. So that would include these hours of television and hours of, uh, of video games that are the norm today. All of this stuff, if you're, if you're saved and serving God, you want to serve God, you want to do a great work for God, take all of your TVs and DVDs and videos and video games and all of this trash, take it all and throw it out of the house. Throw it away. It is really not part of a happy Christian home life because the devil is using these things to poison the souls of, uh, of young people. And when these young people come to the age of accountability, they are so brainwashed by all of this devilish entertainment stuff that they do not care to get saved and get right with God and to be born again. And lastly, rule number 17, teach by precept and um, example the observances of etiquette. How to eat correctly, how to enter a room, how to salute a person, etc. should be a part of the child's daily training. Finally, let's talk about the kind of habits that we need in order to form and build a happy home. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go. Are our children today being trained? Well, in what way are they being trained? In which way are they trained to go? This says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So, childhood is a time of training, and that really means to form habits. We are forming habits. We're getting our children accustomed to something. What are they getting accustomed to, really? And a happy home life, uh, you will not have that if all you do is go to church on Sunday, you know, this one or two hour meeting, and then the rest of the week uh, you live like the world, you think like the world. Folks, you just have to abstain from all appearance of evil. We need to be different. And the, and the modern culture that is unfortunately permeating um, even many churches, the modern, this, this kind of modern culture is not conducive to a good, Christian, stable, happy home life. The modern fast food culture, the have it your way culture, the take it easy culture, the anything goes culture, the just do it culture will not help you as a family. And the more children you have, the worse it gets. The worse it gets then. You really have to uh, switch, turn off, turn the switch and turn off and get yourself, set yourself apart from this modern culture. It does not help you. The Bible describes the happy home life in Psalms 127 and 128. I'll just read a few verses here out of Psalm 127. It says, Except the Lord built the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Who's building your house? Hmm? Is the Lord keeping your city? It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Well, that's not what Planned Parenthood is teaching you while your children are in, in public school. It's teaching them. Folks, wake up. Wake up, America. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. The children are the arrows in the hand of a mighty man, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So, uh, children that are trained to be obedient and raised God's way, they are like uh, arrows in the quiver of the man, the father in that way. So, his children are in his hands, like those arrows in his quiver, in his quiver, not in the government's quiver. 
not in the quiver, quiver of in-laws and other the, the the other family members, not in the quiver of a youth of, of the of a, a clique of uh, 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 a peer group or something like that. No, they're in the quiver of the man. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. So, in whose quiver are your children? The Bible says in Psalm 128, "Blessed is every one that feareth the Lord." that walketh in his ways, it says, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. So it talks about the wife, and it talks about the house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. It talks about a table, a family table. Do you still have a family table? I see a lot of Christians today uh, who refuse to practice the word of God and all they do is eat out all the time. They they eat out at diverse outlets. You know, there's a real wicked lifestyle forming in America. People have to live in these subdivisions, these communities that are just a real estate investment, these cookie cutter, small, tiny lots with an overpriced two-story house on it with curbside appeal. They live in these subdivisions and pay like $300,000 for these expensive homes. They're really not worth that money. They're just producing enormous bills for maintenance, enormous property tax bills. Um, where, and if you're a Christian, let me ask, where is your tithe? You know, are you not tithing because you live in one of these overpriced subdivisions and then, and then they're paying money to a homeowner's association uh, that tells you how long you're alone, how long your grass is supposed to be, and how many cars you are allowed to park in front of your house. Folks, this is not the American way of property. People came to America so they can have their own land and do on their own land as they pleased, and they were answerable only to God for what they did with their land, and not to some homeowners association. Folks, when, I want, when I'm at my house... I'm going to have prayer meeting, and if 20 people show up, there might be 20 cars parked in front of it. And that's the liberty that I've got in America. And if you uh, have this suburban mentality where you live in your subdivision, and you have to abide by the rules of some homeowners association, if you have a prayer meeting at house, probably the, the homeowners association tells you, hey, what you're doing that lowers the real estate value of this community that lowers the investment value of our if you're really folks you need to get over this greed you need to get over this materialism you need to get back to the ways of the word of God the ways of the Bible first of all you're going to be born again you're going to get saved and then you're going to start asking God what is your Lord what is your will for my life you start doing something for God instead of living for, for the sinful pleasures uh, that this world offers. This world is going to pass away. We sing this song, there's a mansion over the hilltop. So don't quit looking for a mansion on this side uh, of heaven. Are you with me? All right. It says here, the Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. And thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see their children's children and peace upon Israel. Well, read Psalm 127 and read, read Psalm 128. They give you a de definition of what, the, what building a happy home really means. And don't forget, we talked about private property in just, a, uh, just a minute ago. Remember the real American values back from the days... Uh, when um, uh, when the Constitution was written, remember the real American idea, not where we have what we have today, where you have these greedy development companies, develop land developers who want to build their malls and their subdivision. There's these ugly uh, ghettos for the rich. You know this. Uh, income segregated living, these ghettos, cookie cutter houses, everything looks so artificial. It's not real. It's not real. And then these developing companies come in and they can tell you to get out of your old house and then they, uh, they, 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 they can force you out of their property. There's been a decision made, I think, uh, 
by the, by, the, by the U.S. Supreme Court where they wanted to build a Walmart somewhere, some kind of big store, one of them big ugly stores, and now these development companies can actually go and get people, run people out of their houses, and then they can develop, which really means destroy, this land. What a greedy, materialistic society America has become. Shame on you. People are rude. This land is full of, this land is full of crime and drugs. The people are addicted to sin, adultery, fornication, and people are promiscuous. They don't have any Christian character left. And people who do have Christian character, they're being laughed at by their own family. They're being scorned, even by Christians in their churches, by those dead churches where they just sit there and sit there and don't do anything for God and have no interest in the Word of God. Folks, wake up! This concludes part one of the message, Building Happy Homes, presented to you by SolidRockFaith.com. Please visit our site and download and listen to part two of this message. Thank you very much.